When trying to make a fish comfortable enough to breed in captivity, it's always a temptation to create a biotope, or some close approximation to that fish's natural habitat. For reticulated hillstream loaches, that would be a rocky stream with little vegetation and fast water flow that in home aquariums we would typically simulate with a power head. The conventional wisdom about this species is that they require cold and fast-moving water in order to provide enough oxygen for them to survive. Kind of the typical game plan for a reticulated hillstream loach is a good deal of tank space per fish, some smooth stones, a powerhead creating strong water flow, and then also strong lighting to encourage algae growth because we typically consider them to be algae eaters. When these fish bred for me, I was doing almost none of that. So as I go over tank setup and feeding here, I just want you to know that I know that I'm breaking a bunch of hillstream loach rules here, but I hope the results will speak for themselves. So let's take a look at this tank. It's 10 gallons in size, I've got the bottom covered with about an inch of sand, and some medium-sized smooth river stones that I found outside and sterilized. In my case, these stones are about as close as I got to a biotope, and there's a couple of reasons why I chose to include them. The first is that I do think hillstream loaches have an affinity for smooth, rocky surfaces. It's easy for them to cling to, and they also tend to pick a few stones and then guard that territory with mild aggression. The second is that the way these fish reproduce is kind of an egg scattering. A male and female will rise up together in the water column and simultaneously release eggs and milt, which will then scatter around the aquarium, and the gaps and crevices between the rocks and the sides of the tank can create safe places for the eggs to get trapped and then be safe until they hatch. In the back corner of the tank, you can kind of see I have a medium-sized sponge filter and also another air stone that you can't see behind it, and these are my source of filtration and water flow for the tank. In my experience, strong aeration is plenty capable of providing these fish the oxygen that they need, and with regard to the powerhead flow that I don't have, for the adults I would say we're confusing a bit what the fish is built to endure versus what they enjoy. For the fry, I think it's actually better that I don't have strong water flow in here because they're very small and fragile and it takes them a while to grow a body shape like their parents that would allow them to resist a strong water current. In terms of water parameters, my pH is pretty neutral and my hardness is very soft actually in both GH and KH. And this tank is unheated, so its temperature fluctuates from 70 to 74. Now as for the adults, I have six total, but two of them are about an inch and a quarter and I'm not sure those two actually participated in the spawning. But the other four are more like an inch and three quarters to two inches, quite a bit larger. And if I was going to start this over from scratch, I think I would be satisfied with a group of four mature adults. Now obviously we need a mix of males and females, so let me show you how to sex them. It's a lot easier than you might think. It's easiest to determine their sex when they're clinging to the glass in front of you and you can see their underside. This here is a young female. And you can tell because the curve of her head blends pretty seamlessly into her pectoral fins and then the ventral fins, forming a pretty even oval shape over the whole body, excluding the tail. Now if we look at a male, you can see that where the head meets the pectoral fin, it forms a distinct and angular shoulder. Also, the extremes of the pectoral and ventral fins are much more squared off. They're flat on the sides and then form into a visible corner at their edges. It's pretty obvious, right? If you flip back and forth between both images a couple of times, you'll see the difference and then you'll be able to spot them a mile away. Just remember, females are round, males are square. My group is about half and half male and female, and when I was picking them out, I got the largest ones I could find to help increase the chances that they were sexually mature. So now let's talk about feeding. If you hadn't noticed already looking at the tank, algae is not really a significant presence in here, with the exception of a thin layer of diatoms on the glass and some of the rocks that I chose not to remove just in case they do want to eat it. When conditioning the adults to spawn, I gave them some Rapashi Soylent Green kind of out of habit, but I also started mixing in some frozen bloodworms to give them some extra protein and fat. And then on a daily basis, I gave them some live baby brine shrimp, which might seem a bit counterintuitive because they tend to stay suspended in the water column for a long time, but they do eventually collect on the sand, and the adults then easily consume them while doing their sand sifting. It seems that providing a consistent source of protein and fat really did the trick, because within just a couple of weeks of this feeding regimen, I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye and found my first fry. Unfortunately, since I didn't actually see the adults spawn, I can't tell you exactly how old this is, but just having seen some other fish species hatch out and grow, I'm guessing this is about a week to 10 days old. And just look at how small it is. 
negligibly larger than grains of coarse sand. Unfortunately, filming something of this size at a distance kind of exceeds the limits of my equipment right now, but the imagery is going to get better very shortly. Now, a good question to ask at this point is what were these fry eating between the time they hatched and achieved this size? I think it's important to note that while the adult fish haven't been in this tank for very long, this sand has been here with other fish and plants for most of this last year, so the sand itself is quite mature and is loaded with small microorganisms that the young fry were able to feed on. And I'm not just assuming that. I actually put water samples from the sand under a microscope and checked, and there's just all kinds of little stuff running around in there. But also, I think the fry were just sharing some of the same food I was feeding the adults. Not yet the bloodworms and the baby brine shrimp. We would know because the fry would be distinctly orange in color. But when the adults eat the rapashi blocks, they tend to tear it and shred it, and little bits float around the tank. And I think the fry benefited from having that. So after finding the first fry, I started paying a lot more attention to this tank. And while they were a bit reclusive, they seemed to really like to congregate in the back of the tank near the sponge filter. And that makes sense. There's probably a lot of fine accumulation back there. I was able to count up to eight fry at a time, but I always assume there's a few more. All I did from this point on was continue to feed the tank much as I had before. I added small cubes of rapashi food on a daily basis in addition to the baby brine shrimp. I did slow down on the bloodworms though because I wasn't exactly looking for more spawns. And as the fry I had already seen continued to develop and mature, I started seeing more that were of a much smaller size, so actually I think the adults continued to spawn anyway. Now one thing I came across when I was doing research on how to breed this species was that the parents are what they call fry safe. They won't try to eat the fry. And that does appear to be true. Given every opportunity, I saw no attempts by the parents to eat even the smallest fry. I do suspect, though, that the parents might eat their own eggs on accident just while sand sifting, so that's part of why it's important, I think, to include some rocky crevices where the eggs can be safe from the parents or anything else accidentally eating them. Here we can see a much smaller fry than the others next to it, off to the left, and if you see that orange color, that would be a pretty good sign it's been eating some baby brine shrimp. Looking at these fry now a couple of weeks later, we can see they're starting to color up and look a bit like the adults, but haven't quite achieved that body shape with the horizontally oriented pectoral and ventral fins. If we skip forward another two or three weeks, we can see they're starting to look a lot more like the adults. And this whole time, just been feeding the same foods, rapashi, brine shrimp, and they're growing pretty quickly. I keep finding new fry that are of a smaller size, so it does seem that the parents are continuing to spawn. And at this point, I can count somewhere in the low 30s, so I'm assuming I probably have about 40. And I think that's where I'm going to leave this one off. The whole process seems pretty straightforward. The key really seems to be a good deal of protein in the diet to get consistent spawns out of these fish. If you have these on your breeding bucket list, I hope this can be a little helpful to you. And as for me, i got to figure out what to do with 40 hillstring loaches because... They're not going to last in a 10-gallon for long. I will have to move them to a larger tank so that the amount of food I'll have to feed to keep them growing doesn't overwhelm the 10 gallons capacity to maintain water quality. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.